All those in favor? Motion's carried. I'd like to uh, adopt the minutes of April 9th, 2019. Is there a motion for that? Councilor Cross, Councilor Burks Hill, all those in favor? Motion's carried. Any business arising from those minutes? Seeing none, we're going to go on to development services, uh, development variance permit 2019-02. Thank you. Well, just to a brief presentation, it's shorter than what I did last week. So you'll recall this variance on 4th Street over by the post office for two. 25 foot lots to put a single family home on each. Uh, variance is to reduce the side yard setbacks and to relocate parking from the lane to the front yard. There's the two lots right there and the existing houses on both sides. Uh, and again, yeah, so to permit vehicle access to the front yard where laneway, laneway access already exists and to permit parking within the front yard setback and to reduce the side yard setbacks between the two vacant lots to 1.2 meters and to reduce the side yard setbacks to the adjacent lots to the north and south to 1.3 meters. There's a picture of what the buildable area on the lots is right now and that's the proposed buildable area and also shows one parking in the back or in the front and one parking in the back for each lot. We did get uh, public notifications were hand delivered and mailed after council's last meeting and we did get two written comments. Uh, one of the persons um, that wrote one of these comments also visited me in City Hall. The comments were about snow storage, parking and access, uh, the overall density of the area and building form and design and the impacts that this has on views and shadows. Rather than go through each one of these and discuss them in detail right now, I'm gonna leave that for questions from council unless yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll turn it right over to questions. Then. The recommendation in front of you today is to is to approve uh, the variance for issuance, but I'm happy to answer questions. So, Councilor, before we put the motion on the table, I'll ask if there's any of you that have any questions for Mr. Sturgeon regarding this, Councilor Younger. Yeah, um, through the chair, um, can you go back to the last slide, please? Or to back to the board? Okay, so I was just reading these comments this morning when the agenda was updated. So the one is 409 Third West. Is that the, is that the, which one is that? If I go back to uh, this one, the comments were from the neighbors here and here, I believe. So they're both on that side? Yeah. Okay. So um, can I just ask you about these then? Uh, there, can I ask? Yes. Yeah, okay, so um, I just wanted to take them off in the order just about a couple of issues, which I'm sure we're all, all going to be asking. So with the secondary suites in the back side, in relation to the parking, I th um, we had discussed that there was going to be one one parking spot on each for each unit. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. So currently, is there parking allowed in the alleyway? The, the bylaw is worded such that when an alley exists, mm -hmm. Parking must be taken from the alley. Now, in a situation where this is a plowed lane, okay. plowed alley. Now, the plowing does not occur past fourth, so the laneway between uh, third and fourth is the last lane to be plowed. So fifth, sixth, seventh, etc. Those are not plowed. So in that case, it would not apply. The the bylaws a little out of sync with sort of the public works aspect of snow clearing. But nevertheless, the bylaw does specify when laneway access exists, parking is to be taken from the lane. The variance is to allow parking from the front for one of the stalls. Now, what, what this does is that the, there was, because it, because the lots are of a particular metric size, I, I can't recall the number in the bylaw, only one stall is required for the house. If the, if the lot is over, it's 300 and something square meters, then two stalls are required for the house. Okay. So in this case, it's only one, but a second stall is required for the suite right. if they choose to build the suite. So it would have been two stalls side by side in the rear. Yeah. What they're asking to do is locate one of those stalls in the front, yeah. and then this hatched area right here functions as a bit of outdoor open space, uh, also functions as an access, and also functions for snow storage. Right. So one of the concerns that was brought up was where is all the snow going to go? Well, yeah. in the case where there was two stalls side by side, that's a very good point. In, 
this case because there's only one there and one there. Yeah. There's room to take everything from this and pile it in the front garden, as you would see around town quite commonly. Okay. So that that's the that's the parking variance. Right. If that answers your question. Yeah, no, that makes sense there. And then um, I just had a question about the um, the I don't know if the shadowing is about the one maybe that came into you, but in regards to just the sunlight and the shadowing from the taller homes. I think in, on a different attachment, it's on a different one in here, it shows how much uh, higher they are than the... I don't have that in this package. No, sorry. no, that's fine. No, back. You, you showed it already. Uh, there's the... There's this yeah. render. Yeah, this. So it's this, this render drawing then. Um, What's your thoughts on that? We're planning the department's thoughts on that with the height and, and, and whatnot and the blocking of the shade and stuff. Because I'm thinking that there are, my understanding of reading this, was there concerns about the, the sun in their backyard sun? I'm not clear what exactly your question is asking. Well, so with the height, because are we asking for a variance to go above that red line then? No. No, there So there's no variance actually being asked for for height? No. So there's just concerns about the height, but the actual, but the, the bylaw actually allows the height, that's what I'm trying to understand, sorry. Sure, so the bylaw allows 12 meter height. Right. This zone is a bit funny. Um, funny in the sense that it allows both apartment buildings and single family dwellings. Okay. However, the height and the setbacks are geared towards apartment buildings. Okay. So nowhere else in town can you build a 12 meter high single family home. Okay. Typically it's 10 meters. But the zoning allows it. In this case, the zoning allows right. it. Right, so that's what I was trying to get, I worried it wrong, sorry. So the dotted red line is, is uh, up here is the allowable height. Okay. The dotted red line right here is the height that they're proposing to use. Okay. The reason why it crosses through the roofs is, is how we calculate height. So, it used to say stuff to the so it's the average of uh, uh, too much yeah. coffee between the eave and the peak. The average between those two elevations is the height. Right. Okay. So I put a uh, condition in the DVP that the height of these buildings would be what's being shown here. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sorry, poorly worded question, but that's what I was looking for. Okay, thank you. Have a So, Mr. Sturgeon, if this was an apartment building, you could go, it doesn't matter what, could go up to 12 meter height. That's correct. Okay. Yeah, so that was it. And if it was solid, then of course you'd be more concerned about shadowing onto the neighbors. Better? Yes, it would be 12 meters tall, which would cast a higher shadow, and then um, the other effect would be that you would not have the opportunity for light between the buildings right. or, the, or the views that you would get from that. So I understand the concern from the, the drafter of the email and that yes, there is going to be a change to views and shadowing and, and what they see out of there. Uh, as a planner, my opinion here is that this is a better alternative than having a 12 meter high mm -hmm. three-story box right. on the lot. Right. Uh, Councillors, any other questions? Councillor Cross? Yes, Your Worship. Mr. Sturgeon, I'm um, not sure that um, Mr. Councillor Yonker was talking about the parking issue. I'm not sure he was talking about the, the crowd. You were talking about the snow. But one of the complaints was just the size of the area. And the uh, complainant here is saying that a pickup truck with a snowmobile on it is six meters and the maximum available space to park with it overhanging is 5.5 meters. So that seems to be a little risky given the types of tra traffic we have here. Uh, or they just don't have space for it. For three, Your Worship, yeah, yeah the, the bylaw minimum is 5.5 meters. Okay. So we're not requesting anything above and beyond that. Uh, yeah. Presumably, the buyer of the house would take that into account when they're, Fine. When they're buying either the house or the vehicle. I have a second question for you. Um, so there is a request to Council for a variance on the side setback from the bylaw of 1.5 meters to 4 zone is actually a 3 meter setback. 3 meter setback. And if they, if the builder here did build a uh, single larger structure in the 12 meter height, then they would have to adhere to the 3 meter setback as well, unless they again ask for variance. Yeah, it's, it's a hypothetical scenario where, where we're, we're addressing the, the proposed variance right now based on what we have in front of us. Yeah. Um, right. The other alternative is a 3 meter setback and a 12 meter height. Um, so, so from the so from the planning department's perspective, three meters to 
less than half of that is a big change in personal space for the adjacent properties. From a planning perspective, what's the argument for us to want to do this? Because it seems like a real invasion of privacy to me. Fair. So setbacks usually increase the more the larger the building you have on the property or the more intense the use. Now this isn't um, say Kelowna or Vancouver where apartment buildings would have a zero lot line setback. So you're right up to the sidewalk and you might have a canopy like we'd see downtown. Right. But in a residential area um, where you've got a large apartment building, you would increase the setback to reduce the, the effect of the, the, the imposing nature of amassing. Um, a standard side yard setback in a residential zone uh, in Revelstoke is 1.5. In other municipalities with housing forms like this, it's as low as 1.2. So 1.2 to 1.5 is a standard setback for a residence. That's four feet. It, uh, it accounts for uh, limiting distance fire separation when you come to building code issues, and it also allows for passage down the side of the house. So um, if they had come in and requested a three and a half story or four story building that was much, much taller, and they were asking for that same setback, I think we'd be having a different conversation. But given that they're coming in at a height that's, that's lower than most houses we see in town, like if you go down, say, 5th or 6th Avenue, where there's some of the, uh, I like to call them the tall and skinnies, the, uh, the two and a half story houses with the steep pitched roofs, mm -hmm. those are much taller than this. Okay. So, and what setback is on those properties? Uh, well, about 1.2, 1.5. I'm a little, little bit guessing there. I'd have to pull the computer up and, and, and look at it. But. but the builder here bought this property knowing it was a three meter setback. That's correct. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Councilors, any other questions? So there's two lots of wall here, isn't that correct? Yes. Two lots. And you, you demonstrated that the, if you live to the recommendations of the zone, the R4 zone, your footprint for the house would be very, very small. It's unbuildable. Yeah. The red line, if you can see that in the center of the lot. <laughs> so that's, that's the reality we're talking about. Don't put a lot of variation in the setbacks and really decommissions the lot. Yeah. Well, except for if I other option, yeah. except for building a single building three years back and yeah. making it fit the single lots. We use the two lots, yeah. yeah. So that, that brings up another discussion. The zoning dictates the setbacks, but the building should dictate the whereas the building should actually, so you're building a, in an R4 lot, the setback says three meters, but you put an R1 building on a single home, which do you live to? Do you live to the zoning or do you live to the, the building type? And that's a, that's a very, that's a problem in our area. Yes, and, and what the, the, the point I wanted to make is, is that our zoning, and, and one of the um, emails we received alludes to this, but the, the zoning is out of sync with the lots mm -hmm. in this area. And there was some planning work that was done several years ago, if not decades ago, that was looking at higher density in this area. But that didn't take account of the fact that there was five lots on this site. And so if there was only one large lot on this site, we wouldn't be having this conversation because it would be someone coming in either applying a subdivide or they'd be looking at doing a building. So we have some catch-up work to do with our zoning bylaw to fix these kinds of things. And it's unfortunate that we have to present these variances to council because of the limitations of the zoning by law, this is where we are. Council yeah. Sherlock. Um, so just to address that conversation, and we talked about it a little bit when this was first brought forward, with talking about those zoning bylaws and the plan to update them, to the, the plan to make them sync up better. Uh, I know Marianne's been doing a lot of work and the department's been doing a lot of discussion on what that looks like going forward. And I'm wondering if we can just explore just briefly, does this fit with what the direction of the zoning bylaws is going to be going. Um, there's mention in the comments about setting precedent for this higher density skinny house um, and whether or not that's desirable. So I'm just curious, I'm, from what I remember from our conversation at the last meeting, this was the direction that we were looking at going to help foster that density. Um, but I just hope we could talk about it a little bit. That's a hypothetical question, though, because we don't know where we're going. That would be an right, OCP. So that'd be part of that OCP process then? It's yeah. the community it's vision of our law and talk about the strategic planning. Right. Dealing with some of the zoning things. So when we look at this plot, mm -hmm. and, and Mr. Sturgeon, you can correct me if, I, if I'm off base here, but if we were to build a traditional fourplex, mm -hmm. we would need more land mass to do that. Is that correct? 
I don't want to say one way or another. Okay. Uh, if you were to abide by the three meter setbacks, I think it would be a bit of a challenge. Right. That may, may be feasible. Yeah. And, and so when I look at this, and I look at it because this is in an R4 area, that uh, area that we could build an apartment on, yeah. and there's two skinny 25 foot lots, this is a great way to utilize that space rather than leave it empty for a long period of time, hoping that someone would come along and buy all of that property, yeah. and then probably would have to buy up an existing home, demolish it to fit in an apartment right. building, unless they put something that just had 10 units or 12 units or, or something in it if they had four lots, right? right? So. From my perspective, when I look at this, this is a great place to put this sort of infill. Mm -hmm. It's not uh, the heritage area where we've got the typical two and a half story that Mr. Sturgeon is talking about, right. and it, which was a, a house that I owned on 4th Street, that sort of thing. But then now you're down to one thing yeah. rather than yeah, um, no, totally. two in, in this sort of thing. So when I look at the densification in my mind, this is a great yeah. way to utilize that space. Right. And, uh, and get it out of an empty grass filled lot. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. And if that 1.5 meter setback is relatively normal for that style of buildings, then I'm definitely more comfortable. And they've spoken with the direct neighbor who lives next door and he was okay with that. Yeah, there was a comment about that in the, uh, I was right here, in the package. The neighbor, when I referred to north, I was referring to this right. as the most immediate and adjacent northerly lot. Uh, mm -hmm. The north arrow, as you can see, is right here, so right. we could construe these as north as well, so I apologize for that. that I hope it wasn't misleading, but uh, no, these neighbors over here were not directly consulted with, aside from the notification that was mailed. Not too much was no feedback from the guy with the bad this neighbor right here yeah. uh, showed no concern. Yeah, that's what I mean. And so there's always going to be concerns when we're backing up alleys because I've lived on, on 4th and 5th and the driveways are directly behind each other. And the point is you're paying attention when you're backing out that your neighbor's not backing out at the same time. It's no different than backing out on the street or different mm -hmm. cars, that yeah. sort of thing. So I see that as a, as a positive. <laughs> Um, so I have no uh, qualms about this, but I'm going to ask if there's any other questions with councillors. Now we're going to go to the public and see if there's anyone that would like to speak to Councillor Ellie. Uh, Nicole alluded that some of, some of the bylaws don't match the zoning. Uh, are there a series of them that we can sort of, I know the bylaws are under consideration to be rewritten, re revised. Are there a, a group of, that, that could be an easy win where they don't need a lot of, uh, I mean, it just, just regulations that don't seem to fit. Are there worth some bylaws or some recommendation that we would make that we get these things implemented sooner and rather than wait for a complete revision of the bylaw? So I'm going to bring you back on track, Councilor Elliott, right, because yes, we can have that conversation, but we should have that at another time okay. because we're Councilor Yeah, I just want to say that uh, it's, it's a tough one because I understand and I hear the concerns from these neighbors, but for me, I think this is a greater sign of the issue that we have here that our housing bylaws and zoning needs to be desperately updated to match, like Rob saying or Councilor Elliott. Um, but in the meantime, um, we can't be arguing that we want more affordable housing and then not allowing any housing to be built. Housing is going to be affected by demand, supply and demand, and I don't want to see this lot sitting empty. And, it's, and like Mr. Sturgeon said, it's not like we're dropping a four floor a park square apartment building here these the design looks to be some nice building so yeah personally I'll, I'm, I'm going to support it Council Rochelle and Council Cross. so I, I really appreciate that the comments we received were very intelligent and thoughtful and um, I uh, <coughs> I feel that Mr. Sturgeon has addressed the uh, the parking issues with the snow removal which I think is a very valid complaint and um, personally, I, I support this. I think we need this kind of infill housing. And as one of the people commented, I, I don't feel that this is a one-off. I do feel this is the direction that we're likely going. And um, obviously, that decision will be made with more public feedback for, from the entire town. But um, basically, I, I, I think that it's a good project. 
Yes, <laughs> Your Worship, fellow councillors, I'm not going to be supporting this motion. Um, I agree with everything that's been said. I actually think this is a great development for us. Three key principles are at work here for me. The first is um, until we have that public process, we actually don't know where we're going. We can guess, but the public may have a lot to say about that. That they may not want this kind of housing. Uh, that's number one. Number two, the developer knowingly bought this lot with the restrictions on it. And I have huge issues when developers do, builders do this, buy lots hoping to change the bylaws. And the third and most important for me as a fundamental principle is if as a citizen of Revelstoke you can't rely on an existing bylaw, then what good are we as a civic institution? If everything is up for debate and nothing means anything, then we lose the faith and trust of the public. And on those three bases, I can't support this, and I don't think we should. Okay. Even though I think it's a great project. Good. Thanks, thanks for your input. Appreciate that. Any other councillors with comments or questions? When I go to the public, is there anyone in the gallery that would like to speak to this issue, development uh, permit? Kathy? Yeah. I'm just a, an observer, and I have observed many of the skinny houses that are being built in our community. And I notice one of the most particular things is that, uh, and I agree with Mr. Cross in regards to the privacy, I, I've, I've noticed that uh, most of the buildings have these wonderful high balconies and a sitting area with a nice patio and things. They're beautiful homes. They're really lovely. Um, and I do appreciate the development. But the one thing that I'm concerned about are uh, not only the existing bylaws, because they are a foundation of our community, but also the older homes that are lower down. And I uh, will bring up the comment that Mr. Cross made in regards to the privacy issue with people. And I think if we stop and realize if it was our home that was down here, and the new existing building being built up with a wonderful view that comes down over our backyard or our privacy in our backyard or our privacy in our, in our area that we've been establishing for a while, I would kind of go to the, the neighbors that have that, that lower lot and the existing um, place of family resident and then the newer buildings that are being built so that the view is up here onto the lower lot. And I think that I've heard this from several people, and especially over on 7th Street, the newest building that's been put up there. It's a very good view, and it's quite an invasion of privacy, and I'm not sure how anybody else feels about that, but I think that if I were in that home, I would be very, um, I would feel a little bit invaded. Thank you, Thank you for your comment. Uh, I know that uh, with the development and planning, when they're looking at the building permits and development permits, they take those issues into consideration it's correct to the degree that we have the legislative authority to do so right. so uh, in a variance it's unfortunately not something we can take account of uh, unless we're dealing with height uh, when we're drafting a zoning bylaw it is feasible to um, put limitations on the use and, and very broad limitations on the form of the building um, in the sense that you know second floor has to be set back more than a first floor it's not a development permit area. So the, the comments surrounding um, sort of broader community impacts are, are incredibly valid and not necessarily items that we can address through DVP. Right. Thank you. Anyone else in the gallery would like to speak? Hearing none, and uh, councillors, any further questions on this? There's a motion in your package. Would there be someone like to put that on the table, please? Councillor Yunker? Uh, yeah, I can. That um, DVP 2019 02 5059 North Project 1. Oh, sorry, read that wrong. That development variance permit DVP 2019 02 be issued. We're second for the motion, Councilor Ryan. Any further discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Opposed? Motions carried with Councilor Cross opposing. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to move on. Thank you, Mr. Sturgeon, for your presentation. Announcements from the mayor. I just want to express my uh, my kind thanks to the community for coming out last week, uh, Tuesday, and dealing with the caribou uh, uh, conservation issue and uh, speaking to that issue. Much appreciated, and uh, kudos to those who came to speak on both sides of the issue. Appreciate hearing from everyone. 
Um, this council doesn't take the concerns lightly, and uh, as some of you may know, there was a, uh, a media release today from the CSRD in which uh, I and Mayor Rice sit on as well, and uh, we had discussed that uh, about our concerns regarding that. So letters coming out, going out from the CSRD to uh, to the minister uh, with our concerns regarding that. And uh, this council will be uh, dealing with an issue uh, regarding that as well coming up. So I want to say uh, thank you to all of council for being present and for your uh, time and also for your input on that. Uh, much appreciated. I want to move on to uh, item 7A, the Youth Liaison Work Plan. Leslie Hoff. Leslie, you're here to uh, present. Yeah. Podium Jewelers, thank you. Go Leafs. I was thinking about wearing my shirt and then I didn't just So the YIC formed in 2010 as a committee focused on creating opportunities for meaningful youth engagement. In 2011, the Okanagan College put together the Youth Assessment and Youth Action Plan through significant youth input. The YAP plan helped to identify gaps and act as important reference for service providers and other organizations working with youth. In 2012, the Social Development Coordinator helped secure community-directed youth funds through Columbia Basin Trust. This funding led to the creation of the Youth Liaison position, as well as the YAC being formed, to help provide a more formal process for the overseeing the contract and the funding. Um, these funds were such a big success that CBT created the Basin Youth Network. We were used, Revelstoke as a community was used as a model because our success was so strong, and many communities uh, replicated what we did. Sorry, I'm so nervous because this is kind of meaningful to me. <laughs> um, so the Basin Youth Network today has all 26 communities in the Basin receiving these funds. As I mentioned, we are definitely a model community, and a lot of them have reached out to us, uh, to the city, to the high school, uh, just for support and how they can have their, their community support youth in the way that we do. Yeah, so the YIC formed in 2010 as a social development committee arising from the youth rebels, from the <laughs> rebel sex substance use strategy recommendations for children and youth. This, this slide highlights that the YIC includes all who work with youth in our community. Collaborative, collaboratively, we've been able to identify gaps and priorities for youth programs and services in our community. The work over the past three years have been driven by the goals and priorities not only set by the YIC, but by youth themselves. So I'm just going to speak briefly to some highlights in there, recreation and accessibility, mental health and wellness, as well as youth leadership. One of the largest successes in recreation and accessibility was the creation of the Youth Access Fund. Originating from the Poverty Reduction Working Group recommendation, this fund was able to help remove financial barriers associated with sports, recreation, arts and cultural programs. We're fortunate in Revelstoke to have so many opportunities for youth, but the largest barrier is the cost associated with them. So rather than the Stoke Youth Network creating new soccer programs, we can just help relieve the financial burden on some families to access sports, recreation, arts, and cultural. Uh, today, the Youth Access Funds remove over $24,000 in financial barriers and has seen a steady increase in referrals. Um, a lot of the funding comes from Columbia Basin Trust, RCU, Community Foundation, and we've also got a lot of incredible donations from Taco Club, local law offices, um, just as well as like community donations. Um, so it's really neat to see the whole community is kind of partnered to support youth in accessing extracurricular programs. Um, another highlight is the completion of Revelstoke Skate Park, which is awesome. <laughs> it was rated as the top priority for the youth in the Youth Action Plan. And in 2016, at the high school, youth raised $2,000 to also sh show their financial support rather than just kind of sitting there and talking about it. They, they, they put their, their money where their voice was, which was amazing. Um, in 2018, after request from RSS students and the Stoke Youth Network launched the Rebel Stoke Youth Mountain Bike Club, um, 
this, what's really neat about this is the success of the club last year that RSS has actually turned it into a school club. So that just shows that the, we're, we're able to build capacity off of the things that Stoke Youth Network's doing. Um, in addition, the RCA Wandering Wheels and I will also be running a pedal and pop program. So a fun little spin, spin off of the pedal and pipe weekly ride. And that will just be focused on getting youth out to ride together throughout the summer months. Um, especially because in the summer there is definitely gaps in programming for youth 12 to 18. So this is kind of, uh, yeah, kind of hitting on a lot of those pinpoints there. Um, youth also identified avalanche training opportunities as a gap. Majority of the courses are only available for those aged uh, over 18. Um, so it's really nice to offer some youth outlet training programs that were not only free but easily accessible both at Armour and the backcountry. Sorry. Um, so aside from sports and recreation, a lot of Revelstoke youth identified a lack in arts and culture programs outside of the school. So the Stoke Youth Network offered pottery, painting, and dance opportunities. We also partnered with the Performing Arts Centre to offer free passes for youth to attend many of their events. Um, so the following is some highlights in the mental health and wellness. Again, this is a big priority identified not just by youth, but also by the community. Um, the Child and Youth Mental Health Substance Use Collaborative formed in 2015. It has increased collaboration between service providers, organizations, and practitioners. In my mind, one of the biggest successes was the start of the RSS Medical Clinic, so that happened last spring. Um, and this gives youth an opportunity to access doctors at the school on Thursdays in the morning. Um, one of the best parts about it is I think myself and a lot of the staff at the school also benefit more than a lot of the students. Um, saves us going down the Selkirk Medical Clinic, which is awesome. So, yeah, <laughs> many people benefiting from that. and. Uh, and we also have nurse the school, we also have the op clinic, so I'd say three to four days a week we have medical services right in the school, which is absolutely incredible. Um, we also continue to host the RSS wellness fair and wellness workshops. So the fair provides an opportunity to learn about the supports and resources available in the community. We generally have about 20 booths ranging from organizations to doctors, nurses, um, we even have CrossFit come out and talk about, you know, uh, physical literacy, we have RCU showing up to the one coming up to talk about financial literacy, so multifaceted in everything that kind of contributes to health and wellness. Um, the workshops that we offer during lunch hour, and these are a little bit more of a focused discussion on topics that are important to you, so uh, this could be anything from healthy nutrition to dealing with stress and anxiety to um, how to have better peer peer engagement, um, all sorts of things, and those are all just youth identified, and then we bring in speakers to help facilitate them. Uh, the Breakfast Club, um, <coughs> that started at RSS, and it does exist in all the school districts now, or in all the schools within the school district. Uh, it was originally just off the side of many of our desks, but it's incredible now that we've received grant funding to have coordinators in each of the schools to make sure that there's fresh food every morning for every youth. Um, in addition, we've also been offering a lot of after school programs. So this has been board games at the library, Friday night youth nights, all sorts of things just to give youth a space to go in the evenings. Um, yeah, get them out of the bush and inside and <laughs> kind of be able to connect with their peers and also with caring adults, which is super important. Um, within the youth leadership, the Stoke Youth Network and School District 19 have been able to support the Media Week Clubs. So these clubs are focused on providing opportunities to volunteer and raise awareness about social justice issues. This has included community cleanups, volunteering at the food bank and food drive, as well as raising awareness around women's rights and other social justice issues. Um, in addition to the clubs, each year we take about 30 youth to We Day in Vancouver, and it's free of cost to them uh, through uh, writing grants and that kind of thing to help support and alleviate those costs. When we're down at We Day, students get the opportunity to hear from public figures, activists, celebrities, um, and kind of get inspired to think global, act local. Uh, this year we also, when we were down there, we volunteered at um, a youth homeless shelter, so it was really nice for them to be able to make that connection within the city and see that there's a lot of amazing services being provided to youth uh, down, down in Vancouver. Um, in addition, uh, at the, so my office is at RSS, so I get to 
help out with a lot of RSS programs. And over the past couple years, I've been helping with the RSS leadership groups. So this has involved creating safe spaces, spirit days, and positive school culture, as well as mentorship programs with the elementary schools. So a lot of the high schools kind of act as a big brother, big sister to students at home in Columbia Park. And that's transitioned really well to when those students arrive at the high school to already have, you know, a friend in the older grade is always nice. Um, I think that the most meaningful part of all this youth leadership stuff, and just within this position that I've been, it's been really incredible to see you speak up for what's important to them. So as I mentioned, a lot of the programs that we offer is funded through CBT, RCU, that kind of thing. It's been really neat to see youth writing letters of support for community organizations, or they've gotten up and stood up the CBT community issues program and they keep getting us all the money and it's awesome. And so, <laughs> and they, yeah, and they rally and raise awareness for local and global causes. So I think that that's just been really cool to give them a platform to have their voice heard. Woo, fun day. <laughs> so I'm, uh, I'm excited to announce that CBT has renewed the funding for the Basin Youth Network program. So they are giving the community $165,000 for the next three years. Um, so that's really exciting. That's the same amount of money that we had just received from 2019 to present, or 2016 to present. And so same amount of funding will be allocated. And this funding will be held by Parks and Rec. Um, and it helps support the youth liaison position as well as uh, all the programs that we're trying to offer, or at least give us some groundwork um, and some base funding for the, for the programs that we want to offer. What do we want to offer? So, <laughs> um, for the most part, all the priorities are primarily youth-driven, um, and we listen to the youth priorities primarily, but of course there's always community input, whether or not some YIC meetings, YAC meetings, CYMHSU, so everyone's voice is being heard. Um, so up here, uh, the work of the youth liaison re reflects community goals, objectives, and priorities and mandates. The following some of the top priorities is determined at the 2019 YIC meeting and through youth input sessions. So over the next three years, we look forward to continuing engaging youth in new meaningful opportunities and targeting the priorities. So in the left column, those are some of the top priorities that were voted on uh, at our YIC meeting, which I believe was in February 2019. And then the youth-specific ones, so just through youth engagement at the high school with all the students, those are some of the key topics that kind of kept coming up, and I kind of tried to just put them with some of the top priorities. So at the end, we kind of are looking more at overarching umbrella priorities as a community, and then of course youth are gonna ask for the specific things that they want. Um, so yeah, those are just kind of some of the priorities and goals and things that they've identified as being gaps in the community moving forward. Thanks, Leslie. I, I appreciate uh, you coming and presenting. I think one of the biggest things uh, for me with the, our youth and the, the community is the ability to participate. Uh -huh. So financial barriers or uh, transportation barriers or whatever, and uh, just being allowed to participate. Uh, I would have loved to have had this stuff uh, back in the old days when I was a student in school. Uh, What's that? In the 40s? Yeah. Um, back in the old days. <laughs> uh, but it's really reassuring to see this sort of thing in our community. So thank you for what you're doing and for going out and finding the support and the, the actually giving input. Yeah. Doing that. Uh, for me and, and the kids in my neighborhood because they're involved in this sort of thing and seeing them and how they have uh, come out of their shell and being you know, quiet to uh, very quiet to a very participatory child. It's just awesome to see and to see the kids in the neighborhood kind of rock and this sort of thing. So thank you for that. Councillors, any uh, comments, Councillor Younger? Yeah, Your Worship. Um, I just want to say thank you. You've been doing a terrific job, and with a young child growing up in our house, um, this is a great place to raise a family and children, and I think you play a huge role in that. The reason why is so everything you're doing, keep it up, and awesome job. Councillor Younger. 
Um, I sit on the board for the Community Foundation, and we were talking a month or two ago about some funding for youth initiatives that had to be started, initiated by the youth themselves for it actually to be, uh, for us to actually grant that money. And I know in previous years, sometimes it's been a little challenging because sometimes the applications seem to come from teachers or from parents or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but it might just be that that communication hasn't happened because it sounds like there's so much engagement on your end with the, 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 the YAC, is it the YAC, the one that they're part of? Uh, they're, 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 part of they're, part of they're part of it all, for sure, right. yeah. So we do have two youth that sit on the YAC as well, and then the YIC is kind of anyone that kind of works with youth, but for sure their input. Yeah, anyways, it's just, it, I don't think it's a ton of money, but if there are other like, smaller projects that you think of, I think this funding is every year. It's just available, and I don't think they've used it the last couple of years. So. I have had uh, Linda reach out in okay. passing, um, and we've been trying to figure out the best, because of yeah. course there's certain restrictions and yeah. edits, and I think that we're trying to figure out what the legacy will be in some of the programs, right. but yeah. yeah, maybe we can... Yeah, that would be great if you have if someone come in and chat. <laughs> we can probably change some of those restrictions if it means getting that funding out. For sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate Very that. Awesome. Thank you, Councillor. Any other comments? Have any comments or questions? Councillor Ellie? The uh, bike arrangement. Mm -hmm. I think I've seen about 50 kids go by on CPR Hill there. Yes. It's very significant. I'd say out of all the programs that I've done that has been the largest, uh, last year we had about 35 youth out every Friday for our rides. And I have to give huge thanks to the RCA. Uh, Skookum donates free rentals. For, so it's all, everything we're doing is free. So Skookum is donating free rentals if kids don't have it. Uh, Wandering Wheels has um, been volunteering a bunch of their guides in kind so that we have instructions, uh, instructors and liability and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so this um, this spring, RSS has now taken on the club, which is awesome. So that's just helped build capacity, and Skookum continues to donate the bikes. And then that means I can pull from Wandering Wheels in the summer to offer the pedal and pop. So just judging by the news and the excitement coming yeah. down down the hill, like that, just not, it's just yeah, <laughs> it's awesome. It's so fun. Quite pleasing to see. Yes. <laughs> uh, maybe on a series of the, the Breakfast Club. What? Uh, how does that work? So the food, so at our set, it kind of started off with the corner of a bunch of our desks, including some of the community connection staff members, as well as myself, and some RSS staff members. And so we were accessing food from the food recovery program, which I believe everyone's familiar with. So a uh, huge amount of our programs are just uh, everyone's fed through food recovery, which is incredible. So we were doing that, and then the Stokies Network was um, subsidizing some of the costs, like peanut butter and jam, and it was pretty much just like a buffet. Um, we did that for the first few months, and all the staff were kind of taking turns doing setup and takedown. And it was huge. It's not just youth that might not be eating at home. A lot of kids have swim practice, you know, at 6.30 in the morning, and they're hungry, but when they get there, our staff are eating from it. I'm hungry, you know, you didn't have time to make breakfast or lunch or something like that. Um, and so with that success, we're, uh, Ariel in the school district was actually able to apply for some funding from the Breakfast Clubs of Canada, I believe, is the funding stream. So they were able to secure some money, and then that opened up to um, the elementary schools as well. They, they do hot breakfast, we just do grab and go. It seems a little bit more fitting for the high school. Um, and then at the elementary school, they were doing hot breakfast only a couple days a week, but with the funding, it's five days a week, you're getting fed at every school. Mm -hmm. so, so you start, you just show up in the kitchen space or something? Yeah, so at the high school, or at the elementary schools, I'm not exactly sure. I believe every school has some form of kitchen um, that they're running it through. And then at the high school, we just have a spread, and then we've invested a bunch of toasters. Um, Lisa Moore is one of the main coordinators over at the high school, and she also is making smoothies. She might have a bunch of hard-boiled eggs, like all sorts of stuff, so she's coordinating. So now that it's like, before when it's just food recovery, love the program, but sometimes it doesn't necessarily have the same nutritional value. Uh, so now with this funding, we're able to help subsidize and make sure that you know, it's nutrient-rich, protein, all sorts of stuff, and then we are still accessing food recovery in so addition. Was, it, was there a, a, a recognized necessity for this, like the warrior of children going to school? Yes, 
Yes, for sure. And not just going to school hungry, but it's amazing. It's created like a total, it's like the water cooler effect. Everyone's socializing in the morning at the high school in the common area. You go there, it's like everyone gets off the bus or bikes in and everyone just wants to hang out there and yeah. chit chat before class. And it's, it's not just about the food, it's about all the conversation and, and the connecting, all the teachers are there. Everyone's kind of connecting in a fun environment, which has been really incredible. Yeah, I just, just want to add, like, we we'll want to really get to the meat of it. Yeah. Do we have a large population in our country? Yeah. Yes. That's what I'm getting to. Yeah. Yeah, and that has at the youth, at the YIC, the Youth Initiative Committee meeting in February, um, having, ensuring that there's access to nutritional food, which is rated one of our top priorities. Yeah. Yeah. The, the awesome thing uh, is that uh, no one's turned away. That everyone, no matter where they come from, no matter if they're yeah. just in the middle of or whatever, they can access food without uh, embarrassment. So everybody can come, they can eat, and they can be part of the group. Yeah. And uh, for, uh, for me as a grandfather to be able to see those sorts of things going in place where everybody feels like they belong and there's no shame in that, that's an awesome mm -hmm. thing.
Two motions there, so someone would like to do item motion number one regarding the financial plan. Sure. Councilor Cross. Um, that the five year, oh wait a minute, I'm down too far. A, a number one. A, a, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, the committee of the whole recommends to council that the city's 2019 property tax distribution be approved. There's a second for that motion. Council Brooks Hill, any discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Motion's carried. Item number two. Oh, Councilor Cross. Uh, the committee of the whole recommends to council that the city's 2019 financial plan objectives and policies related to taxation revenue and permissive tax exemptions, part of the 2019 financial plan bylaw, which reflect no substantive changes from those in 2018, be approved. A second for that motion. Councilor Sherlett, any discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Motion's carried. Item 9A, bylaws. I want to put that motion on. Councilor Sherlett. Five-year financial plan 2019 and 2023, bylaw number 2245, be adopted. Is there a seconder for the motion? Councilor Brooks Hill, any discussion on that motion? All those in favor? Motion's carried, thank you. Item 9B. So we want to put that on. Councilor Sherlock. Sure. For the 2019 tax rates bylaw number 2246, be read first, second, and third time. Is there a seconder for that motion? Councilor Cross, any discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Motion's carried, thank you. Number 10A, unfinished business. Parks, Rec, and Culture. We want to put that motion on the table. <laughs> sure. Councilor <laughs> Cross. Uh, let's go here. Um, uh, that the mayor, <laughs> that the mayor and director of corporate administration be authorized to sign the tripartite service agreement between the city of Revelstoke, Revelstoke Arts Council, and Revelstoke Accommodation Association for the provision of a municipal service being entertainment during Street Fest 2019 in Grizzly Plaza and for assisting the management of the Performing Arts Center for a one-year term commencing April 1st, 2019, ending March 31st, 2020. Is there a second for that motion? Councillor Elliott, any discussion on the motion? Councillor Elliott? Um, one of the things to do with the entertainment at the plaza is the train bell. Mm -hmm. The constant bell every time there's a train, whether it's moving or whether it's stopped. Yep. Maybe that's a consideration for investigating whether what, what can be done about it. Well, that. I can tell you that we've gone to CPR in the past and it's about safety, so it's not going to stop. There was an instance a few, years, a few years back where they stopped the bell when it was not in motion at near the railway museum, near the trailer park that was there. They had decommissioned or made an arrangement with CP to stop it while the train had stopped. Okay. And that was in place for many years, but then once the trailer park was removed, the bell starts going again. So I'm wondering if that's possible at the current crossing. Uh, we can ask. We can uh, engage uh, CP Rail and see if that's a possibility. Um, I wouldn't have high hopes, but uh, definitely if you want us to ask, then uh, I'll write a letter and we can ask that question. And, and further on that, if you're talking to CP Rail, they might talk about Eastern Access and what, what can be done about that road or what, what trade-offs could be made. Well, that, that road is uh, partially CP road and partially city road. Yeah. So I've talked to public works in the past and they've done what they can regarding grading and that sort of thing. Um, there's nothing in our budget that we just passed regarding uh, blacktopping, that sort of thing. So again, we can talk about it, but uh, that would be something that public works or engineering could talk to CPR about and see if they could come up with anything. Yeah, I, I think it's room to, to I, many years ago, Max Singh had created a footpath over, the, over that uh, intersection as an option for our city. And maybe that's worth exploring in the future as well as an option to decommission the crossing and then put a footpath over, but won't run through the neighbor, neighborhood, but uh, as an option. Yeah. Just an, some, some idea. That's what? No, I'm just um, Here. talking to this board. Okay, yeah. All right. I don't know where we would investigate that or who we, who we put that, whose hands would put well, that. Well, we'll I'll talk to engineering and we'll yeah. see what we can do. With the motion that's on the table, any further comments or questions regarding that? 
All those in favor? Motion's carried, thank you. Item 10B, someone for that, Council Cross. That the Mayor and Director of Corporate Administration be authorized to sign the agreement between the City of Revelstoke and the Revelstoke Curling Club Society for the lease of the curling rink located at 1100 Vernon Avenue for a five-year term commencing May 1st, 19 to April 30th, 2024 for 1% of all the income per year collected by the club based on the prior year's gross revenue. Thank you. Is there a second for that motion? Councillor Elliott, any discussion on the motion? I think this is a great agreement that uh, Mr. Nano has put in place with the uh, with the curling club. It allows them to uh, operate and keep open, and it's uh, it's about lifestyle. So I really think it's a it's a great thing. Any further questions or concerns on that motion? All those in favor? Motion's carried. Thank you. 11A staff reports. Councilor Brooks Hill. The, the Art Gallery project located in the alley behind 101 First Street West, Selkirk Medical Clinic, and 123 Mackenzie Avenue, Royal Bank, be approved subject to the building owners meeting all requirements of the development permit approval process. So there's a second for the motion. Councilor Ryan, any discussion on the motion? I think this is great to have some art down our back alleys. So I think uh, it's nice to open that up. Definitely for uh, it brighten, it'll brighten the alleys up uh, because there'll be some lighting with that as well. But also uh, being in a community that loves art, this is a great thing to uh, basically make sure our alleys don't turn out uh, in rough condition. It's a great thing, I believe. So, any further discussion on this motion? Councilor so Sherbet. Sure Obviously, I was sitting in on the Public Arts Committee as we were debating this project and looking at the merits and where it's going to go in the future. And I'm excited. This is the first chapter of hopefully many. We really excited to see how it comes together. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. Any further discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Motion's carried. Thank you. Item 11B. Someone want to put that motion on the table? Fantastic group today. <laughs> <laughs> the three members of council. Sorry. That's okay. We can go at it at this angle, or we can have a discussion about which three members would relate to. You want to discuss which members before we put the motion on the table? Thank you. Sounds good. Do three of you want to volunteer, or do I want to volunteer three? <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Elliott. Anyone else? I'll, I'll sit on, um, I'll volunteer. I do have to check a scheduling issue with family, but I was able to get a firm answer on that before today. Yes, what day is it? May 9th? Yeah, it's Thursday. Thursday. Mm -hmm. I'll volunteer. Councilor Bricks, Councilor Cross, you're going to ask Kevin. Okay, I'll put your name down. Yeah, I'm 90% sure, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, but I just may have to switch out just to okay. just out of town and stuff. That's for some, if, uh, if one of you can't sit and my schedule allows, I'll take places with them. Oh, you don't go as well? Uh, no, I'm not going. <laughs> I probably will be there anyway. So, Your Worship, this is uh, a review panel that's being set up to hear complaints with respect to setting up um, a parcel, a tax roll, parcel, yeah. parcel tax parcel roll. Tax roll. And um, there's only four things for which um, complaints can come forward. So we will give you a little bit more education on it, the people that are going to be sitting on the panel so that you understand. So it's not just, you're not going to be sitting there blindsided by what's happening. And it is quite, um, it's mostly about addresses, names, um, and there are some things about exemptions or the size of the taxable frontage of a parcel. So right. it's just four things. Yeah. So people can't just come in and complain about the actual tax board itself. They actually have, a, have to have a reason. So it's quite structured, and it's the first time we have, have had to do this. So, um, so it's going to be a learning curve for all of us. Yeah. 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 So as volunteers, we're not arbitrating the dispute or the discrepancy. We're just listening to them. And, and to see staff it. will get you the details, yeah. and then, um, then there's other processes. If there's changes that we have to go through, posting to the public and whatnot. Mm -hmm. If there's none, then it can just be um, approved. Uh, authentic, authentic, what's the word? Authenticated. Authenticated. Yeah. Right at that meeting, and there won't have to be another one, but there may be two meetings. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the detail. Yeah. 
Okay, does someone want to put this motion on the table uh, that uh, the three councillors will look after this? Will be present? Councillor Schumann? Sure. The three mem members of council, Councillor Elliott, Councillor Brooks Hill, and Councillor Cross, be appointed to serve as the parcel tax rule review panel for the subject bylaws as in the agenda package. Great. Is there a second for that motion? They, they can all go together because there's no numbers, so if we could just do it all together, that would be great. They all depend on each other. Okay. So just to carry on and that. Oh, and that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then, yeah, so, and then May 9th, 19 at 20, or at 6 o'clock in council chambers be set as the date, time, and place for the sitting of the parcel tax roll review, and that advance notice be published indicating the time and place of the panel sitting in accordance with section 94 of the community charter. Thank you. Seconded for the motion. Councillor Elliott, any discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Motion's carried. Item C, 11C, Parks, Rec, and Culture, it's a splash park pad. Um, Lori, any uh, presentation on that? Councillor Ryan? I can recuse myself. Okay, yes. thank you. Councillor Ryan is recusing herself because she works for one of the uh, people that put a bid in on the splash pad. Lori, anything that you need to discuss before we put the motion on the table or any concerns? Um, I can highlight your motion, okay. so it's in the report. Thank you. So uh, we did receive two tenders. So the project was tendered twice. The first time it went out through um, an MMCD contract. Both tenders were declared invalid. So we had to re-tender the project again. And the second time we did it through bonfire. Both tenders were compliant. Um, I would like to highlight that um, under the MMCD document and structures to tenders, that there was some optional work included in the tender document that was to be included in the tender price. Um, one of the applicants did not include it in the tender price, but because they had the unit costs for the quantities, the engineer was able to calculate the total tender price and that was determined to be the final tender price submitted. So that's what you have in your staff report today. I think it's clarified there in the wording as well. Yeah, yeah so just a question about that then. So um, with the Jake and Jay construction, that's their that's their bid amount, including the optional work. Yes, that's correct. With, which I understanding was that it's the colorful concrete or something. Yeah, it's yeah. Um, the integral concrete and some uh, coating on the concrete work as well. So I just want to make, so that's the that's the price that they're going to be held to to do the optional work as well. So the whole the entire scope of the project plus the optional that they were allowed to bid on. That's what they're going to be. That's what, that's what they've submitted as their cost, yes. Price. So the optional work is still optional. So this, the city does not have to move forward with the optional work. The way it works with the MMCD contracts is you bid on the optional work, but that does not mean that we move forward with the optional work. It all depends on what the cost of the entire project is. So if there are cost overruns in the project, you don't move forward with the optional work. The funds will be used to cover the cost overruns in the project. Would your cost overruns then be at the, the city's fault then, or would that be at the contractor's expense? It could just, just trying to understand. It could just be part of the project costs. Because we just kind of estimated how much it's going to. Yes. So. But tentatively, right now, hypothetically speaking, if there was no cost, that's including the optional work. Yes. Okay. Yes. And same for both this. Yes. yes. So the optional work we have not agreed to yet. Mm -hmm. So that would be done through a change order. Mm -hmm. So if there's overruns, it means that they run into something that no one's. Expected. That was well, not predicted. I was just yeah. looking at the, the differences between the companies and the other. So. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Councilor Cross and Councilor Brooks. Uh, yes, Your Worship. Uh, Ms. Dynamics, so just um, what, what percentage roughly is the option part of these prices? Just roughly, you know, 20%, 20%? Um, I 
know, I looked for that number and didn't see it, so if I missed yeah, you, you did not get the breakdown of right, how bids were that. submitted, so it's just probably over 20%. Okay, so that's the option. And, and, to, and to be really clear, the option is at our discretion based on the total cost of the project as it unfolds. Correct. Including unforeseen. Okay, Correct. Thank you. Councilor Cross, Councilor Cross already asked my question. <laughs> Any further questions? Um, just Councilor question. So the, just for the funding, I believe that the last council took $100,000 from the RCFC legacy fund and donated to and then the rest has just been by the Splash Park Foundation has been come up with through donations and grants. Is that my understanding? Mr. Nunn, are you very Do your worship. Yes, we have the RCFC legacy funds, RMI funding right. as well, and then there was also through the city's um, capital plan through the Parks and Rec Department, fifty-five thousand. Fifty-five thousand. Right. And then once the park is completed, then it becomes a city-owned asset and managed by the city. Then it, it's it is a city-owned well, asset the right now. Asset. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Councilor. So the uh, Splash Park fundraising six hundred. I believe they're at close to 650. Six, well, 612 plus the 55,000. Yeah, 612 plus the 55,000. And were the, uh, the organizers of the, the Splash Park, the, the leaders of the performance work, were they involved in the uh, allocated decision process? Were they informed of the decision for the bid for things that came in? They were not involved in the tendering process. The tendering process was managed by WSP. So, Councilor, just so you know, there was uh, some meetings with the Splash Park people and, uh, and some city staff regarding this. They made their uh, concerns and questions valid uh, before the process was started, and, and uh, everything was admitted that way um, so that they were aware of how the process was going to go. Right? So, um, so basically, with the bidding process, uh, once we award the contract today, process uh, as far as getting started can happen whenever the contract is ready to go. Is that correct, Mr. Uh, through your worship, there will be an award letter that will have to go out and then signing of uh, uh, contracts. Right. And then once the city issues the notice to proceed, they have, I believe, it's two days to proceed with construction. Perfect. Great. Councilor Cross. Uh, yes, Your Worship. So, uh, just out of interest, so the, the, the organization, I'll call it the organization, there's 667K of funding here, roughly in total. And uh, the low bid here is 570, including the optional work. So, suppose they run into something that is cost overrun and, comes, and means the project will be over the 570 with the optional work. It seems like there's enough of a buffer in the funding that they could, in fact, do the whole project, including the optional work. I'm just looking for a, as much as possible in this project. The optional work is going to add a lot to the project for the citizens mm -hmm. and for the kids. And uh, it seems like there's enough of a fudge factor that, that that would be possible. Am I reading that correctly? Or? It may appear that way, but there is no contingency set for this project. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. And typically, I know with the skateboard park, we had a contingency of 25% on the project. Okay. And we dipped into the contingency to round out the project and to add um, to add different obstacles into the project to make it a better project. Mm -hmm. But we did that as the project advanced through change orders. So, just and that's how we would probably proceed with okay. The, with so the there is that option to come yeah. back to a council and say, you know. And your worship, just some more questions for us now. So, what happens um, hypothetically speaking if there's money left over? Well, depending on the money, it, so in my view, we have 55000 that we budgeted through the Parks and Rec Capital Project. Right. So, if there was money left over, that would just go back into the Parks and Rec Reserve Fund. So Well, it's uh, great to see somebody come forward uh, that's local, and I think that was uh, one of the, our concerns, and definitely one of the spot part of people's concerns. Uh, let's hope that we can build it local, and so the performance are local, so I'm excited about that. 
So, any further questions before we put the motion on the table? Someone did that. Um, may I ask a question? No, you may not, Kathy. Unfortunately, okay, I'm asking you. the counselors. I'm sorry. Sorry, Your Honor. Um, anyone want to put this motion on the table? Counselor Yoder. That the contractor construct a splash pad at Firewall Park be awarded to Jake and Jake Construction Limited for a contract price of $569,562.50, excluding GST, and that the Director of Parks, Recreation, and Culture be authorized to execute the contract between the city and GHJ Construction. There's a second for that motion. Councillor Elliott, any further discussion on the motion? Councillor No, I'm just excited to go use this. <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> yes, you would be. Hey. Hopefully, yeah. You're going to take your kids to Young adults are allowed to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Discussion. All those in favor? Motions carried. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Nato, and uh, thank you, Splash Park Society. Appreciate that. We'll let our counselor back in, Sydney. So I have no uh, no correspondence here, and it doesn't appear that anyone from the press is here to ask questions. So I'm going to ask for a motion to go on camera, pursuant to sections 90.1c, G, and K of the community charter. So I'm going to make that motion. Councillor Charlotte, Councillor Cross, all those in favor? Motion's carried. We're going in camera. Thank you, public, for being here.